Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Shanae Masia. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of uh, Pretoria, and I will be chairing this session. This today's webinar uh, from the Regional Studies uh, Association series Please note that the Regional Studies Association is the global and interdisciplinary network uh, for urban and regional research uh, development and policy. And it supports members with uh, latest research funding schemes, networking and uh, publishing opportunities and spaces to grow research and uh, careers. Uh, the Regions in Recovery, a global e-festival, uh, a collaborative partner event will take place between uh, the 2nd and 18th of June 2021. 20, uh, uh, Please note that more details on these initiatives can be found on the RSA website. Uh, we also have a new app called RSA Hub, which will enable uh, you to network and attend virtual events throughout uh, the year. Um, just a few housekeeping issues. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and will be made available for RSA members on the RSI lounge. Um, now, uh, make sure that when, if you have questions, you put your questions in the question and ans answer uh, box. It's indicated uh, below your screens. Uh, and please use the hashtag uh, RSA webinar to tweet about uh, this event. I will go on to introduce our speaker today uh, in this webinar, which is uh, featuring an RSA sponsored new book, uh, The Belt and Road Initiative as Epochal Regionalization. Uh, we have got author uh, 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 Shaming Chen, uh, who will discuss the book's framework for understanding uh, the BRI's uh, large scale and cross border regional uh, corridors and sub corridors that have strong connected impacts on globalization, urbanization and development. And you will use the case study of the Djibouti Ethiopia development uh, corridor uh, in Africa. Uh, Shaming Chen uh, is uh, previously served as the Dean and Director of the Center for Urban and Global Studies at Trinity College uh, Connecticut uh, during the period 2007 to 2019. And he is currently the Paul E. Raitha Distinguished Professor of Global Urban Studies and Sociology at Trinity College. He is also a Distinguished Guest Professor at Fudani University in Shanghai. He is also an adjunct professor at the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. And his research focuses primarily on intersections between cities, uh, special, uh, special economic zones, and the uh, global economy. Uh, and before he comes in to present, I would also want to mention uh, that our discussion today is Vanessa Tang from the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. And she is a senior policy development consultant and a lecturer of international economics at the University of KwaZulu Natal. Natal in South Africa. Uh, she has consulted for various local and international organizations, uh, including the National Research Foundation, KwaZulu Natal Economic Development, Tourism and Environmental Affairs, also the African Development Bank, African Union, and African Capacity Building Foundation, and has published numerous uh, papers in government reports, journals, and books on issues that are to do with international trade, uh, welfare, tourism, special economic zones, and regional economic uh, integration. I will uh, allow uh, Shaming to make his presentation now. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or wherever you are. Um, well, I'd like to thank uh, Regional Studies Association for uh, hosting this webinar. And the title of the talk uh, is different from, uh, you know, the project title. Uh, which is this. Uh, the project was supported by the Policy Expo grant from the Regional Studies Association and also involves two other scholars uh, who are acknowledged here. And the information about the book uh, is also here. It's been published in a series of articles so far and it will be out soon. And so this is sort of the book uh, table contents. 
and I only have enough time to focus on uh, chapter one and four today. But the book has uh, covered three different but interrelated cases in chapter two, three, and four. And so it's a relatively short book, and there's a lot to cover. So the book's uh, three cases uh, share some similarities. And first of all, they all involve um, freight train connections uh, as infrastructure projects. Uh, you can tell that uh, I've chosen uh, the freight train uh, uh, as the main focus. And, uh, and also, I think these three cases all involve uh, land sea connections uh, between landlocked countries uh, in different regions, uh, neighboring China beyond China, and also the extended connections to uh, sea transport. And of course, these corridors also cross multiple uh, international boundaries uh, from one, which is the case between Djibouti and Ethiopia, and to multiple uh, transnational boundaries, such as the China-Europe freight train uh, that go through six to eight countries between Imperial China and Western Europe. And also a very strong running theme through these cases uh, is the uneven regional development and the policy issues regarding the amelioration of uh, uneven development. I think the most important thing to recognize is we're talking about the Belt Road. There's all these growth corridors that encompass multiple cities and their hinterlands across international boundaries originate from deeply inside China and they extend far beyond. And the differences are also noticed here. They involve obviously different countries, one in Asia, one China, Europe. And in this case, I'm focusing more on, on Africa, but obviously with a long distance connection back to China. And I think the substantive question here is to really look how these different cases uh, involve different combinations of infrastructure, logistics, circulation, production and consumption uh, along corridors. The actors vary uh, quite considerably and they all face very different opportunities and challenges. And this should be a very familiar map and the BRI in six corridors. You know, I think there's a general tendency to look at the overland economic belt and marine time silk road, these two long green and blue lines I think I'd like to really shift the attention to really these six corridors, you know, much more closely, but also the sub corridors that make up some of these long corridors. And some of the names, the names of the corridors are labeled below, and uh, they are they should be relatively familiar and to the uh, the broader uh, audience. And so let me start out. Uh, by uh, providing a broader global context for thinking about the urban regional corridors. This study uh, came out in 2016 by uh, two Austrian and one German scholars that they used the literature survey to identify you know, around 70 urban corridors as the upper map shows. And then they use nightlight data and surface transport data, you know, to really uh, refine and, and measure out and model out, map out uh, these corridors. We can clearly see the difference between uh, this couple of maps and the previous map. Obviously, this is 2013 data when the BRI was officially uh, announced. And clearly, you don't see uh, these long corridors. Uh, on this map, and certainly uh, the Djibouti Ethiopia corridor obviously is black. But it's interesting to notice that these differences between the earlier corridors, I've identified three of them here, and the one on the left uh, should be the most familiar uh, because it goes back to the 1960s to Gene Feldman's uh, book about the Northeast corridor, starting from Boston in the North, going down to Washington DC uh, in the South with New York in the middle. 
in the small city of Hartford, Connecticut, indicated by this um, pink little circle, is where I'm physically based. Trinity College is located here. And then you can see, uh, obviously, this is within the US, the earliest regional urbanization megalopolis backbone linked by uh, uh, you know, Amtrak. So you have the Acela Corridor, uh, which is the fastest train in the US. In fact, the, uh, the current president of the US, uh, Joe Biden, took this uh, corridor uh, hundreds of times. So in some ways, people also characterize this a Biden Express. In the middle, uh, you have obviously the blue banana, as it's known, it goes back to the late 1980s, uh, to a group of French geographers, um, uh, Roger Bernay, led the study that identified, you know, what he called it for discontinuous a backbone linking, you know, Western and Central Europe, probably eight countries, you know, from um, Liverpool, Manchester, down to Milan or, or Turin in Italy. And, and then, of course, on the right, you have an East Asian case uh, identified by a South Korean geographer in the mid 1990s. This is known as the Besetel, Beijing, Seoul, and Tokyo. And you can see this is obviously across the sea and also over land. So uh, the earlier study on the global urban corridors uh, included all three of these. And they concluded that the uh, boss wash, the one on the left, is really kind of the classical reference point, what they call the master corridor. And then both the blue banana and Besetto were identified as more fragmented because they cover more countries, more boundaries, and with lots more um, you know, empty and maybe some passive places in the rural areas, you know, between the major cities. But to uh, to summarize, uh, you know, the earlier and older corridors, they share some of these features uh, in common. Obviously, a corridor has a linear shape, different length, but generally there's a range about 100 uh, kilometers in terms of length, but the boundaries and the width are very difficult to define. Okay. And then, but in general, these corridors share a very strong informal market-oriented uh, growth process, you know, with very little uh, state level, national level, sub-national level planning. And also, you know, they are anchored to uh, a large international urban centers in the more in advanced economies. Uh, when there's relatively little given the uh, relatively uh, 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 limited uh, uh, differences you know, between the major cities and the extended metropolitan areas, so there's very little uh, inequality and imbalance. But I think if you look at the BR corridors, not just the six major ones, but also their subcomponents, what well, you can see, and these are generally continuous uh, over land, but also with connection to sea, some of them have longer distances. The longest one is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor that runs almost 3,000 kilometers, you know, from Gwadapur in southern Pakistan all the way across the, uh, the mountains into Kashgar in the Xinjiang region. And also these uh, corridors, uh, if you add them up in terms of the territories covered, there's a very large scale global regionalization. And also most importantly, they share the feature of being China driven or China initiated. And they anchor to uh, quite a variety of large coastal interior and smaller border cities, uh, some of which serve as the entry and exit points for the growing routes of China, Europe train train you know, between uh, interior China and the heart of Europe. And also these corridors cover a variety uh, of developed and developing countries, and also in larger and, and growing scale of hinterlands, right, that have been brought in into the orbit of these corridors. And of course, there's the issue of coherence. And I think the last point I want to emphasize is because it uh, covers multiple international boundaries, including small remote marginal cities, and the gaps between them are also much larger. And here is a conceptual uh, thinking uh, chart, really looking at the cities 
uh, that started China's opening and reform, you know, from the coastal area. And then zone two, uh, the interior inland region uh, priority of development through, you know, the, uh, the Western development strategy. And in 2013, the Belt Road have began to bring the coastal and interior cities and the border regions together. And then the extended westward connection to the neighboring countries in Central Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia, the three parts of Asia that surround China, mostly on its western uh, overland border, and then the Europe freight train, China uh, going to, to Europe, and also a spur line, a secondary line going through West Asia into Iran and Turkey, and then uh, further on. But the important case that I'm focused on today is the origin of the development of Chukho, right? That was the first mover to get China uh, going and, and, and set the example, a template or model for urban and regional development inside China has been extended all the way uh, to East Africa, even though geographically it's discontinuous, but the institutional and the policy and the practices actually are very directly uh, connected. If we just take a quick look at China versus Ethiopia and Djibouti in terms of uh, basic economic development indicators, obviously vastly different. But then if you look at Shenzhen, which is this uh, top uh, line, obviously has led China uh, continuously over the last 40 years and have reached the highest per capita income. So if you narrow it down to Shenzhen and then more specifically to Shukou, and then it makes the connection and the comparison uh, to uh, both Djibouti is a small uh, country and Djibouti city is the dominant capital of a small country. And also Ethiopia, especially looking at the capital cities are the Addis Ababa, you know, much more comparable in terms of city and the region level comparison. So uh, I look at Djibouti, you know, briefly, and this has been called by uh, a different, you know, Chinese uh, uh, scholars, but also uh, the company that's uh, the primary driver of development is the Shekel of East Africa. Others call maybe potentially the Singapore of Africa. And now look at uh, briefly the zone-based industrialization uh, in, in Ethiopia, not only looking at the large stainless companies, but brought in really the very active private sector uh, that is increasingly uh, investing in, in the manufacturing. And then I'll briefly take a look at the ADR, the Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway, as the connection between the two uh, anchoring poles, uh, if you will, of the regional development corridor. So this is the map that shows the, uh, the stations and the two uh, ends of the, uh, the railway uh, linking Djibouti and um, Ethiopia. But this region obviously is, is highly strategically important. It's at the mouth of the, uh, the Red Sea, uh, connecting the Gulf of Aden and, uh, and the Swift Canal. Many, many uh, oil tankers and other ships uh, pass through here uh, every day. And also, if you're thinking about uh, the location of Shirko, so I want to go back to things um, uh, where it started. You know, with the Shirko, this is a tiny little area of a, uh, uh, a port. And at the tip, uh, western tip of Shenzhen Special Economic Zone, uh, going all the way back to 1978, you can see, obviously, it's very close to Hong Kong. And so the original development of Shirko has a lot to do with this one man. The name was Yuan Gong. You know, he was uh, a Communist Party member, a military leader. Uh, born in 1917, and so this Chinese in the upper left describe his bio, right? But in 1978, you know, he was appointed the vice chair of the board of the China Merchant Group, which is a large uh, Communist Party uh, owned, uh, so-called Yangqi, right? It goes back to 1872, which was founded by the Qing Dynasty, now headquartered in Hong Kong. And so he was appointed to lead the development of the shuttle. Two square kilometers, tiny little area, and they had to blow up the mountains and level the field 
uh, in, in, the, in the very early stage of development, building the basic uh, municipal uh, infrastructure. And so 1980, a picture in the upper right, and this is what Sherco looked like then, right? This is a really in the south a modern city, but it has really becoming a very important part of Shenzhen as a mega city, as Shenzhen's own first mega city, and to say honor to him, memorialize him uh, in this uh, a statue in the lower left. And then if you look at Sherco, for example, and tracing its very origin and ex experiment, really was made as an exception, as a frontier for China's market-oriented reform, right? To try out capitalism. So there's a whole number of number one or first, right? That was introduced. You can see them here. But what I would like to focus on is this idea or practice of port, park, and city model. The, the acronym is PPC. And the port was built in the front. And then they have the industrial park behind the port in the middle. And then the city uh, was built up you know, from behind the parks, PPC model. So I drew it up this way just to kind of uh, break it down and unpack it a little bit. You can see you know, the port obviously is the first step, right? Uh, either see, but increasingly we see the, the port idea has been extended into the interior dry ports, the land hubs for the China-Europe trade trade. So, uh, so the, the original 1.0 uh, actually has been upgraded, but mostly the focus on logistics and shipping. Uh, 2.0 or 0.2, the second step is the park. Special zone, industrial park, you know, specialized, uh, concentrated clustering of manufacturing. Originally, Shenzhen was labor intensive sampling, but later upgraded to high tech manufacturing. And the city is really the last piece. Right, it's more integrated development, and the idea is in the, in the square in the middle, it traces its origin, its execution within China has varied across the region. And when it comes to Djibouti, again, we see another uh, recombination of the PPC model, but really it's not a direct transfer of this practice of urban development. It is a process of reassembling it, I think the literature on urban assemblage, I think it's very apropos here in kind of looking at the different threads and how they're brought together. But if you compare Shekho, you know, to, uh, uh, to Djibouti, the important differences to notice, right? And the bottom, uh, you have the Shekho process. And I drew this from uh, a wonderful article by uh, several Chinese scholars published in the journal City uh, last year can see obviously the port was the first stage of development, 1978, led by Yuan Gong, right? The China Merchant Group was headquartered here. And then the industrial park took place, you know, a couple of years later when they leveled the fields and put in water and power 1980. And then it began to enlarge into a miniature city or community of integrated development of course, we go further north into the east, and that's really the much larger area of the Shenzhen uh, special economic zone. So, but for Djibouti, you know, when it was brought over uh, in 2016, uh, a little bit earlier, uh, China merchant groups or a sub subsidiary China merchants uh, port holdings or CM port was really the lead company uh, that first bought out some equity stake. You know, from Dubai World, which developed the uh, terminal, the terminal, uh, container terminal port, and then there's a, uh, a bit of decision to expand into a new port, BMP. So that's 2016. So they made a $400 million investment in building it up. Uh, and then, of course, most recently in 2019, uh, the company and the Djibouti government and the governing authority of the Djibouti port sign an agreement to build a new they call East Africa commercial center, building off the original old port uh, that built by the French um, when the French was uh, colonized in Djibouti. But the difference here is that um, uh, in, in the case of Sherco, you have a much more geographic, a tight development. But in Djibouti, and it's an elongated 
uh, more separated segmented development uh, along, along the port. And just a little bit of information about the global reach of CMG and C, uh, China Merchants Holding. Again, is a very active participant in the Bell Row Initiative that controls 36 ports in 18 countries, ranks very high in the global uh, uh, maritime shipping. Uh, and then you can see this is a, a set of uh, photos from someone who was involved in building the port. Uh, you see from the upper left, clockwise, you can see there was nothing there. And of course, the completion of the port uh, in the lower map. And then also, I think this is uh, a documentary that was made about the development of this port, where they really try to go back and look at the 14th century Chinese um, uh, maritime general Zheng He's um, a long expedition from the coast of China to East Africa, even though the final destination, according to archaeology evidence, was really uh, today's uh, Kenya, but they link it to this region, you know, where Djibouti is located. And then this is sort of uh, the celebration of the completion of the port where they brought uh, five presidents of East African countries and interviewed the, uh, the head of the Djibouti uh, Port Authority. In the lower right, you have the Djibouti finance minister talk about the strategic partnership between China and Djibouti, which was signed in 2017. And this is the middle part behind the port, Djibouti's free trade zone. You can see manufacturing, you know, began to, uh, to develop, you know, with this container box. And again, the idea of a one-stop shopping service center in the lower right was very much modeled, you know, what Shenzhen tried at the very beginning, concentrating all the offices and services in one stop. And then again, I think in manufacturing, uh, this is sort of a, the, uh, 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 some documentation in Chinese uh, about the growth of the companies. For example, in the upper right, in Chinese originally, uh, when the parts and the components came to, from Hong Kong, from Southern China, uh, they would be assembled in UAE and then sold in Ethiopia, Somalia, and Kenya. But now they, they wanted this uh, uh, zone to have the export manufacturing function, uh, assemble the parts and lower the production costs and market them much more closely, lower left, a logistic company, which fits with the Djibouti's development priority. And the one lower right is a medical company that's making PPE, uh, most started last year. And again, the last part of the, uh, uh, the formula, uh, the C, you can see China has in, become much more active. Uh, this is goes back from the old French uh, quarter. And then of course, you know, the, uh, the outside area of Puti and Shenzhen towns. And China was involved in 1970s building a people's um, monument and as well, obviously a foreign aid project but the newest uh, uh, initiative is to try to complete a new financial district uh, in the old central city area. But also uh, CMG and the uh, China Merchant Force has also been very active in bringing uh, Djibouti and Ethiopia together. The upper right photo is the president of Tokyo Koso came to visit, uh, looking at business opportunities. The lower left is the delegation from Austria interested in building a joint venture uh, to process coffee, a major export item from Ethiopia. The one in the lower right is the Ethiopian Djibouti officials talking about connect intermodal transportation between sea and the air. The other uh, side to this or facet of this development is the Chinese company was involved in building this, continues to promote Djibouti uh, free trade zone back in China connecting to cities in Southern China, to the ports of Ningbo near Shanghai in the lower left, and most recently in the China International Import Expo in Shanghai. So briefly to summarize um, the Djibouti part of the tripartite case, we can see that obviously there's considerable upgrade to the port's capacity. And also I think it reinforced Djibouti's niche role as a shipping and logistic hub. And also uh, uh, four and five are, are uh, uh, also very important. 
because of the East Africa hinterland uh, uh, behind the port uh, is that becoming a access, a gateway uh, for Chinese companies, other international companies uh, to uh, expand their business. And also, of course, the constraint of bring this model over all the way from Shirko runs into a very different local spatial context in terms of the segmentation between the three components. Very briefly, a couple of very simple charges to transition to the industrial zones. China has become the largest foreign investor. And in Ethiopia, in 2019, 60% FDI came from China. And this is just uh, to illustrate the geographic concentration of Chinese investment, but also to show that uh, this came from a recent study by two economists at uh, LSE that shows the correlation between uh, the growth FDI and, Jibu, uh, and Ethiopia's uh, GDP. And then the projection in the lower right is that Djibouti will continue to grow you know, through uh, uh, industrialization. Uh, the government has announced the growth and transformation, transformation plan uh, both from 2000 to 20. Uh, 20 in two different phases to uh, highlight the importance of manufacturing. But if you look at the uh, the origin versus the destination, right? You know the template versus the emulation, the model. The special economic zones goes all the way back to the 1960s from East Asia. Korea and Taiwan uh, pioneered the export processing zone, and then uh, adopted by China uh, late 1970s. And so if we trace these, uh, the, what these arrows are pointing, we can see from Shenzhen on the right side, uh, you have 1980, the origin, and also the evolution and the stage development, uh, the expansion, diversification, and upgrading in the lower right, right? Where we can trace since PRI in 2013, there has been a consistent thwarted effort, both from the state and the private sector and the provincial uh, municipal uh, large companies to build special economic zones in different parts of the world. I think Africa is the major destination. And here I want to go from the state-owned uh, company, you know, the, the, the main uh, leaders involved in BRI, really the much more quieter, under-recognized, uh, somewhat invisible private companies. And this is the company, uh, Mick Chu. Right, Huatian uh, Group. It started from a uh, uh, middle part of China, but then really uh, took off uh, in Dongguan, also near Shenzhen. Right, so you can see there's a very connected or uh, a link to the to Shiko, to the Shenzhen uh, Pearl River Delta area. So it started out, you know, with the East Asian industrial park in the upper left, a couple production lines, and then it built a light industrial city outside of Addis Ababa and have scaled up multiple production lines, now hiring about at the peak about five, 6,000 workers. Lower, uh, lower left, you can see the slogan uh, in the background, English and Chinese, about Huaqian's you know, corporate philosophy and its effort to uh, increase Ethiopia. And here is uh, a documentary, and also my interviews with different uh, people affiliated with Huaqian uh, again, you know, they have brought over a very strong and disciplined way of managing, but they have also brought hundreds of Ethiopian workers back to China, uh, in southern China, uh, for training. And they have sent a couple of uh, Chinese uh, technicians. In the lower right, a woman uh, teaching a local worker about gluing and sewing. And the most, most interesting about is this man standing up in the lower left. Right, he's uh, Ethiopian, but it was brought to China for training a few years ago. Studied Mandarin, did very well, and it was sent back and promoted to a, a, a manager, and now uh, directs the entire uh, quality control department. So here you have seen the CEO of the Huajian. Right, he was recognized by the Ethiopian government as the father of industrialization. So it's high honor given to the CEO of a private company. Who, by the way, is also very politically connected, you know, to the top of the Chinese government. And also, I think just to briefly summarize uh, uh, the uh, the outcome, the impact, 
And this is the study I mentioned earlier, uh, 2020 econometric modeling, showing the medium to longer term effects, positive effects of Chinese FDI. But short term effects is also negative because it ends up competing with the same industries, with the replacement substitution effect. But most important to recognize is that it has produced is the upper stream and low downstream supplier, so it has helped for us create a supply chain. And my own case study of this case has also shown that, right? Ethiopia has, uh, produces a lot of leather, a cow, sheep leather. And so now you have an Indian company run by a, a Indian Ethiopian who supplies the supply chain, a number of other suppliers. And also the workers have been uh, doing very well uh, in terms of wages and I mentioned training early. The last part of the three case, I want to just talk very, very briefly before, uh, before I conclude, is really the historical uh, older versus the new railway system in Africa, because it's really the larger context for looking at ADR, the Addis Ababa Exclusive Railway. You know, early on, about a centuries ago, uh, Africa, you know, had very few, right? They were built by Western colonial powers, you can see the upper left, right? So you have the Alexandria, Egypt, and then the Kampala, Mombasa railway, and the Luo and the Lopito in Angola, you know, different, different Western colonial uh, uh, influence, but they build it between the port and the, uh, the locations and the regions of the mining and the minerals uh, to ship them out. So what Africa is facing today the upper right map is a really a very fragmented map of railroads, very different uh, uh, gauges, different uh, width of the gauges, right? And the old Ethiopia uh, Djibouti railway built by the French that was completed in 1917 was the meter wide gauge, right? But you can see now is it's the new standard gauge that is uh, 1.435 you know uh, meters uh, wide. But the, the lower one is very important because it's a predecessor, antecedent to the ADR. This is the Tanzania Zambia or Tazara Railway. Uh, China built in the early 1970s. This was map, you no, know, it's a uh, 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 commemorative uh, 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 document. But I think the lower left is very important. This is not the ADR, but it shows the extension of the Tazara and extending it through PRC, uh, Lubabashi, right, and Kowesi, and then connecting to the earlier uh, railway between Luo and Lopito. And China has also upgraded that railway. So this is the very first, you know, east to west across the continent, but there's no obviously continued railway uh, between the north and south. Most of the connected rail system is in South Africa. And this is the ADR. Right, it's a dual purpose railway. You have the passenger on the left, you have the container, uh, the freight train uh, going uh, on the upper right. Every other day, passenger train runs between the two cities. Twice a day, the freight train uh, runs. So you have the training both of the conductors and also the engine drivers. There's a lot more that I won't be able to talk about in terms of technical aspects of the training, but there's a extensive agreement and involvement of, of both sides. Very quick, uh, long list of summary. But I just want to highlight a couple of uh, most important things. It's really ADR is the very first China designed, financed, built and operational managed, you know, for a few years. Uh, it began operation in January, 2018. Obviously, it's quite a long railway, right? And most importantly, I think it's the first electrified uh, railway. Ethiopia has insisted, you know, using electricity as supposed to be diesel engine, which is uh, another a big railway project between uh, Nairobi and Mombasa that was opened opened in also uh, 2018. And also, what's in, most important, I think, you have to think back about the Djibouti port and the manufacturing hubs. In, uh, in Addis Ababa is to providing a much faster, reliable mode of transporting because 90% of Ethiopia's exports go through the Djibouti port, which depends on Ethiopia's exports for 70, 80% of this revenue. So it's critical. 
And then the concentration manufacturing that is probably and growing in other stations along the railway, you know, potentially offers the prospect of TOD. But I think there are also constraints at the bottom here, right? ADI is hampered, electricity shortages, very similar to the special economic zones. You know, Huajian company had to build its own power supply first in order to keep running, you know, the factories. And also there's continued competition with the highway and the management and the bureaucracy. So uh, about no time to go into detail. And here is really the takeaway point, right? Uh, I've narrowed it out to two. The first one, I think, you know, what we have here, there was a, a regional connection, right? The French railway. So, so uh, Djibouti, Addis saw was sort of a natural, earlier, pre-existing development corridor, but whose potential Right, whose scaling and a larger uh, impact, uh, impact has been unleashed, you know, by China fueled and invested in facility development. So I use the notion goes back to Charles Sable of Columbia talk about bootstrapping uh, development, institutional trying out, and then also you have these considerable features, right? The poles, the access, and also uh, 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 the hops and the clustering along the way and the potential into the larger hinterland. And so I will stop here and pass it on to Vanessa. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Shaming, for that uh, lucid uh, presentation. I will allow the discussant, Vanessa, to take up the floor now. Thank you very much, Sanai. Um, it's uh, certainly a, a pleasure and uh, an honor as well to be part of this OSA webinar and to share this platform with uh, my esteemed colleague, Yaming. Um, congratulations, Yaming, by the way, on your forthcoming uh, BRR book. I look forward very much to reading it. And also thank you for your very insightful presentation. Um, this webinar on the developmental growth corridors, as you put it, I mean, of China's VAR, I think it's a very exciting and uh, not only exciting, um, I think it's also a controversial subject that we are touching on today. So um, um, it's exciting. Uh, I'm going to start with the good news, so-called. Um, it's exciting because uh, China, when China first announced um, its BRI um, roughly around 2013, I believe. It was then generally viewed as a much needed um, new avenue of investment that certainly from an African perspective, it's very positive given our infrastructural gap. So um, it's not surprising therefore that Africa was very much taken by the, uh, by the idea. But let's not forget that there's also a large number of Asian countries also taken by the idea because they also um, have that infrastructural um, weakness or gap uh, um, uh, uh, domestically. Furthermore, I think that um, this was also an, uh, 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 an exciting initiative is uh, because there seems to be at that time um, a need for um, economies in, in Europe that are stagnating, that are looking for an avenue of new growth. So we tend to focus and kind of like linking BR with regards to the developing Asian Africans. So uh, uh, to me, I found that, that, uh, that it's not surprising therefore that many countries, um, roughly around 140 uh, nations as we speak, have joined the BRI and have agreed to sign an MOU with China. So um, my next thought, uh, therefore, is what could possibly have fueled perhaps um, many government interest um, in, in the BRI? I mean, um, from, a, from an African perspective, um, I was pleasantly surprised um, and amazed as well that there are so many African nations roughly around 40 sub-Saharan African uh, countries, um, about 17 in the Middle East and in, uh, and in North Africa that are very interested in the BRR. 
And, um, and uh, I think that partially the reason has to be because there has to be a, 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 a mutual gain. They can see that there's some gains that they can acquire. Now, um, for sure, China has made it very clear that they are happily, um, you know, they are happy to and interested in being the, the source of finance. Now, um, I think that many people um, need to remember that, and, and in being critical sometimes regarding the BRI initiatives that have failed, that such initiative as a food for thought, would it have been possible to have like the Djibouti Ethiopia um, uh, railway, the Addis Djibouti uh, railway in place without the BRI initiative under, uh, uh, under the, uh, with the financing of China. The second thought is also that um, such kind of infrastructure that the BRI is, is addressing or taking into consideration, there are large infrastructural projects and um, the such kind of, of large infrastructural projects re requires large financing. And um, if we can, or not we, but if those countries, especially the LDCs, can actually get it readily at low interest rates, I think, you know, there is uh, an, an understanding, if I may say, as to, you know, their interest um, and enthusiasm towards the BRI. Um, a third point that I would like to raise, which makes to me economic sense uh, a lot, is the fact that um, um, BRI, addressing the infrastructural developmental projects, it seems to me aligns very well with um, the uh, some countries, um, for instance, let's talk about Ethiopia in this context, if I may raise. So in the context of Ethiopia, they were, uh, Ethiopia is looking very much at diversifying away from agriculture into industrialization. And um, to industrialize, and if you look at the policy or long-term development policy plan, infrastructure is clearly a key element or component of growth for their future, um, you know, industrialization. So, um, so therefore, it's not surprising for me that, um, you know, there are a large number of benefits for countries like Ethiopia like uh, Djibouti as well, both countries seems to be doing quite well economically, um, you know, with, um, you know, partly, I'm not going to say fully, realistically, partly with the kind of engagements and funding that they have received from China. Interestingly, I, I, I stand to be corrected on that. I believe that China uh, at the last uh, BRI summit in 2019, have kind of given a bit of a leeway to Ethiopia agreeing to, um, you know, um, to forgive some of their little debt. So this is something I stand corrected. Um, it's something to, you know, have a food for thought if it's correct. It's also another, you know, understanding as to the enthusiasm of, uh, and interest of countries or gains or opportunities. But now um, talking on the other hand, um, there is also something that economically it is important to recognize that the BRI initiative developmental wise is excellent, but let's not forget where criticisms are coming. People seem to forget the critiques that to the end, this is a business transaction like any other, isn't it? So therefore the implementation of the BRI initiative you know, um, there seems to be uh, critiques weighing it more in terms of like favoring more China uh, as, as the key uh, finance source of finance and uh, 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 relative to the beneficiaries. So, uh, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt. I mean, as in any business transactions, you have to have an expectation of mutual gains. And the mutual gains are based on what, you know, I've just had a lecture just now is uh, I just was discussing the basic concept of comparative advantage. If I may raise in the issue of, of Ethiopia, for instance, I mean, they embrace, they seem to have embraced the BRI. It's uh, in China's engagement in the country because they are seeing that their comparative advantage that they offer 
that is cheap labor. They're offering some of their resources. They're also offering, you know, the kind of manpower, the land, et cetera. And um, I think particularly cheap labor, that's why the, the, the manufacturing seems to have, you know, um, uh, done pretty well and, and the creation of zones and so forth. But um, on, a, on, a, on a different note, uh, I, I just think that also China is, is definitely coming in, um, you know, with the expectations that yes, I'm also growing or enhancing my trade uh, and uh, network and my investment is not surprisingly going to people that they are interested in. So yes, I hope that um, this is, um, you know, this, uh, the, the presentation that um, of the corridor will stimulate others to possibly look at it on a, you know, on a more exciting perspective, I may say. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have got uh, two questions, one from Sally and another one from Daniela. I will just indicate both and then you can answer once. And uh, Vanessa, you are also free to respond. Uh, the first question is, Belt and Road has been a massive financial and political investment by the Chinese with much contestation. Uh, do you think that they feel that it will be worth it in the short, medium, and long term? That's uh, the first question. And uh, the second one is, um, uh, Daniela is saying, I wonder geographically where the focus of Chinese FDI in the future might be. Would you have feedback on this? And I see Lawrence Gossi. Uh, he has already thrown another question. So three will be fine, I think. Uh, and his question is uh, directed to both uh, Prof Cheng and Tang. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding the concern of debt sustainability in some countries, including African nations borrowing from China under the BRI? You can take the three questions. Okay, I'll take them very, very quickly. Uh, to Salah's question, you know, about... Uh, how BRI is perceived, you know, whether it was a very geopolitical top-down uh, brand strategy. Uh, again, I think increasingly uh, scholars and, and analysts have recognized it's not that, and we should not view it that way because it's very piecemeal. It had so many different moving parts and a lot of bottom-up initiatives, as I have shown, you know, with increasing involvement of the private sector. So it's not all dominated by, you know, the large you know, companies and development financing, you know, the government lending. Um, and I think it leads, it, it really uh, pivots to the second question about, you know, Chinese investment. And again, given so much of the investment is on these large scale transport physical mega projects, so Sally, we're looking at really long-term. I don't think there's any kind of a short immediate uh, payoffs you know, for the countries hosting these projects. But also we have noticed since 2019, there's a shift towards a different kind of infrastructure projects, what I would call projects about people's lives, right? And they have been localized to specific cities such as the new subway orange line that has been launched in the city of Lahore in Pakistan, right? Very ambitious project, you know, for a particular city to helping, you know, ease the transportation congestion, you know, dealing with trans uh, pollution issues. So increasingly, I really see a growing mixture of China's involvement and engagement in not just the show off, you know, the flagship project, such as ADR, you know, such as uh, the Mombasa uh, uh, Railway. And then regarding the second question, investment, I see increasingly coming into the manufacturing sector in Africa, to a lesser extent in Southeast Asia. But if you look at the shift of the manufacturing, you know, from China, we're talking potentially, according to Irene Sun, you know, who wrote about Africa's next manufacturing giant, 
100 million manufacturing workers potentially be shifting out of China, and then you have rapidly growing young population in Africa, you know, going up to 2 billion 2050, high unemployment rate among the working age population. So that's really a comparative advantage, good match, much more than Southeast Asia. I think, you know, on the debt question, again, you know, this has been, um, you know, uh, some call it a myth, other call it, uh, you know, a ploy, but I think it's been debunked, you know, by people like Deborah Broadgun and others, showing that a, a very isolated case in the case of Sri Lanka, Hanbao Toba Poor, by the way, it happens to also be now uh, owned uh, by CMG, China Merchant Group, right, which go up to Djibouti Port, right, but it's really not what I think the original Indian scholar has proposed. A lot of the debt that China has recently um, uh, forgive or extended that for 70 countries. And if you talk to the African leadership, you know, the people who are involved in the crucial middle positions, right? I think they are talking about, you know, the tremendous need, you know, for infrastructure financing, you know, which, which is a necessary point. But I think in few cases where it has led to higher level of debts, a lot to do with the elites from some of these countries who have, you know, vested interest agendas, you know, in Sri Lanka, the former president wanted to put a white elephant project in southern Sri Lanka, which really does not need to be there. And I think it has lots of other, you know, questions about, you know, how um, the, Af the countries that are potentially dealing with China that a half leverage in negotiation with China, you know, can be stronger, can push for more transparency, you know, can, uh, can uh, play off competition. But I think China has really comparative advantage. But that's this point about, you know, why Chinese companies are winning these projects because, because they come in a lot lower in their bids against, you know, European companies, the World Bank and the U.S. Uh, uh, project bids. So that's an advantage that is very uh, unique to China in terms of multiple companies bidding because there's so much drive or push from the overcapacity from inside China to push this investment uh, out. Thank you very much. Vanessa, you want to say um, something quickly? We have two minutes. Yes, um, I'll, 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 I'll go quickly on the first one because it was also um, targeted to, to me. On the issue of, of uh, borrowing um, from China and the, the VRI being a concern, I think I'm just going to leave a food for thought. As any economic transactions, I think there's always going to be a risk element of the project uh, failing. So uh, in any benches as well, but let's not forget, and I think we need to ask as a critical thought, the type of countries that are failing in terms of repaying the debt. Um, food for thought, how is the governance, um, uh, corruption, and also what has been the, um, the repayment uh, trends, if I may say, in the past when they were borrowing from, let's say the IMF and the World Bank. Um, so that's that could be dot 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 maybe you know a linkage with weak institutions. Um, Sally, uh, very quickly, do you think that um, the BRI is a massive financial political investment by the Chinese with much contestation? Yes, uh, it is. Has some of those views that are being put forward and reactions are to me very alarming, but yet uh, it comes back to to uh, a balanced thinking like. Ziaming and I have tried to emphasize uh, in terms of the issue of, you know, mutual gains coming into place. Uh, long term, um, you know, uh, long term is, uh, is something to, to, to wait and see. But we can already see uh, that there are exceptionals, like in any case, there are exceptional cases to, to, to take into account for it being, um, you know, of why there's such contestation. And lastly, where is the focus of Chinese FDI in the future? I fully agree with, um, and I'm hoping as well, that is so much needed. Uh, Africa re really needs a lot of investment. So uh, we encourage that. And um, yes, hopefully coming to the continent of Africa. But um, I think it's also interesting to follow on to um, how's India is, is, is going towards its investment and it's always China following um, very closely behind if India is the first taker. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. Yes, uh, Shaming, you wanted to say something? Well, just to add a last point, if you look at ADR, right? And again, uh, so, so a very expensive project, um, not doing quite to the projected capacity in the first couple of years. But this year in February already, that railroad has uh, carrying volume uh, has already gone up considerably well, compared to a year ago. So I think they're making the adjustment to how it's managed, how it's operationalized. And so we can really looking into the longer term in terms of these, the payoffs for these infrastructure, connective infrastructure projects to stimulate other uh, manufacturing development. I think it's uh, one former Obama official um, once said famously, you know, if you build a auto plant, right, manufacturing led, a Walmart will follow. But if you set up a Walmart shopping center or store, a auto plant will not come. I really see, I think I agree with Irene Strin's argument. I think Africa in terms of next manufacturing power really has, is very promising. I think China has gone through that process in terms of the train of development, which stations to go through first, what is the next stop, I think has a lot to offer to Africa in terms of the grassroots private sector level interaction with more companies coming to Africa. Right now, every year, 150 private sector investment have landed in Africa compared with only two in, the, in 2000. And also, if you look at Ethiopia, in terms of where it would like to go, it would like to push up the manufacturing share with GDP to 17%. Right now, it's only 6%. So there's a lot of room, lots of uh, upward room for the manufacturing sector to grow. Vanessa's point about being a large agricultural economy, making an accelerated transition to manufacturing at a very timely point in which China is looking to redirect, relocate a manufacturing uh, out, the labor intensive manufacturing out. So I really see a potential good match between the comparative advantages conditions from both sides, whether through BRI more formally, whether informally through private sector investment uh, perhaps we need to look more at what the non-state informal channels through which China is ramping up its engagement in Africa. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Shaming and uh, uh, um, Vanessa for the responses. Yes, uh, with our time, I think um, I would like to thank all the participants for attending this very uh, informative uh, webinar. And um, I, I thank your colleagues for taking your time to prepare. Uh, please note that more information on forthcoming sessions on the RSA uh, 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 on the RSA uh, website. Uh, just keep your eye on that. And uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.